This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, portfolio managers at PWL Capital. So let's get something important off the table right up front here. Can you hear Oscar snoring? No. So Oscar's at my feet, as many people know. And he just laid down, and in a matter of seconds, he's snoring like crazy. It's unreal. Oh, good for him. I'm jealous. <laughs> so I guess it's a testament to how good these mics are to not pick it up. So you live in the country now. Have you been out kayaking at all yet? Yeah, I've been out a few times. I've been also hiking a lot. So no regrets, obviously. No, I go for probably an hour and a half walk in the forest every evening. It's awesome. So we discovered flipping around on the weekend just for some recent content. We found a Canadian show that's pretty entertaining to watch. Um, it's called Hoarder House Flippers. Have you heard of this? No. So I know many people have watched the show. I think it's called Hoarders, which, which is quite sad because there's all kinds of issues why people might be hoarders. But this is about people that buy the houses that were owned by hoarders. They pay incredibly little for these houses. They have to go in and... And it's basically empty them and then find out what you really bought because you don't really get a chance to inspect them. So you watched a couple episodes and it's a Canadian show. And in fact, the last episode we watched was from St. Sophie, which I think is north of Montreal. But it's kind of cool to watch Canadians doing this and going to the stores that you and I go to. And, and it's, it's quite entertaining, actually. It's on, uh, it's on Prime, Amazon Prime. So if you're looking hmm. for something light and you want to feel good about your house the way it is now, you watch this, oh, the rotten basement floors and the foundations and the stuff they discover is unreal. Yikes. I don't yeah. want to watch that. Well, you're not a big TV watcher. We were just flipping around, killing some time on the weekend. Um, okay, let's move on. So we're kind of excited to announce that we've uh, we've lowered our asset minimum from $2 million down to $1 million just because we've been working really hard on internal efficiencies and, uh, well, that's that's it. So now we're, we, we were able to lower that uh, that threshold. Um, and again, we pe- people know we don't like to use the podcast as a as a sales platform, but I think it's it's important information because it makes our services more accessible to uh, to more people, which is important to us. Agree. Uh, and then the the other thing I wanted to mention is that we, we we've been doing talks at uh, mostly a w- one large Canadian company. Uh, for the last, geez, six or seven years now, where we go in and, and speak to groups of employees about financial wellness and index funds and all that good stuff. Uh, but based on all of the happiness research that we've been doing, we've uh, overhauled, re- rebuilt that that talk. And uh, we've got our, our financial planners that are continuing to, to give it to, to groups. But we wanted to offer to the podcast community, to people in Canada, because uh, it is a Canada-specific presentation, uh, people in Canada, if if you're interested in having uh, a PWL financial planner give this talk on finding and funding a good life, so it's got the happiness component, but it's also got the why index funds make sense component. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. So if anybody's interested in having that that talk delivered, we're more than happy to supply a person to deliver it. No uh, no strings attached or anything. Um, just let us know. Exactly. You want to talk about the goal survey, give an update on that project. Oh, yeah. So we've collected over 200 responses to the goal survey, which is unreal. Uh, I mean, that was kind of a stretch goal that I had in the back of my mind. Uh, And we want to start working with the data. But the problem is that we're (laughs) kind of like our audience, our podcast audience. We know this from past surveys. Our responses are massively skewed toward males. So before we start working with the data, and we're actually thinking about uh, asking some of the academics with relevant fields of study to help us Mm -hmm. once we have what we feel is a good set of data, Uh, but not super comfortable doing that when it's like 95% male respondents. (laughs) It's not exactly a representative data set to work with. Right. So my my ask is if you have filled out the survey, uh, if you're a male and have filled out the survey, if you could ask a woman in your life to also fill out the survey, that would be hugely helpful mm-hmm. uh, to hopefully get that male skew 
down. And then likewise, if you're a woman uh, and have not filled out the survey and are listening, then please, uh, please do it. It would help. It would help a lot. So we'll put a link to the survey in the, in the show notes and on all of our social platforms and stuff so people can find it. Awesome. That's great. Upcoming guest next week, Vanessa Bonds is here. She wrote the book, You Have More Influence Than You Think. In two weeks, our very good friend and past guest, Dan Solon, joins us for the 22 and 22 reading challenge. And he'll have a bit of reading inspiration for you. In three weeks, Rebecca Walker will be here. She wrote the book, Women Talk Money. And in five weeks, we kind of changed up the order here. In five weeks, we'll be welcoming Ludovic Philippou, is that how you pronounce it? Who is a professor of financial economics at the University of Oxford, Said Business School. So that's kind of interesting, that get right there, Ben. Yeah. Well, he's, he's going to be great. He's very passionate about his research, which is largely focused on private equity. Uh, we're actually going to talk about some of his research uh, later in this episode. Yep, yeah, should be good. And then two weeks after that will be Jay Van Babel. He's the Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at NYU and co-author of the book, The Power of Us. So that'll be another good one. Uh, had some very nice reviews recently on the Apple platform. VT Market Order from the USA recommended it despite, and I don't think we've been called this before, Ben, despite the host militant multi-factor extremism, this is my favorite podcast from two Canadians. So I don't know if that means there's no other podcast from two Canadians. I don't know. And Jay Forth from Canada said it's the best podcast for learning a wide range of financial topics. Most of the episodes approach finance in a straightforward manner that doesn't require a financial degree to understand. Thanks us very much for the weekly education increased his financial literacy and also enjoy the deep dive into the happiness and thanks us for the free socks. So we also received an email to the uh, rational minder information address saying hi to us only as messenger as a social media platform. We couldn't figure out how to comment on our 203rd episode, but just wanted to follow up with some really positive feedback. Loved your paper. Cannot emphasize enough how profoundly the article and that paper resonated with them. Um, very nice comments. New to the Rational Minder podcast. I'm thoroughly enjoying the content and actually found us because we were on the, uh, your videos were linked to the Mark Meldrum CFA prep platform. That's how we mm -hmm. discovered it. Yeah, they've been on there for a while. So Harry, thanks us and you specifically very much. Had a bunch of people connect with me on LinkedIn recently. Connor in Montreal, thanks us for our value-driven and data-supported approach in an industry that cannot always be value and principle-driven. He finds it refreshing and vitally important. Nick in Northern Ontario said that as an engineer working through a CFA program, the content couldn't be much more relatable. Listening to RR has become his routine over Saturday morning coffee before the family wakes up. I hear that a lot, actually. I think we're a lot of people's weekend coffee listening. Mm. An advisor out west, get this, reached out saying he's not happy selling the products they are forced to. It was ask, actually asking me about career options. And then another advisor, Jeff in Calgary, thanked us and said that the, uh, the podcast has helped him build his financial planning practice and he models it after us. And on the reading subject, uh, Luke reached out on Twitter to recommend that I check out some fiction for book recommendations specifically. And then there were none. So... We'll look into that. I already have, I got this book list now because it was getting kind of chaotic organizing which books for which weeks. So I started loading it up into my Evernote and I'm like, I got books stacked up well into the fall because we have the, this every two weeks. We've launched a book club at work, as you know, so that's going to be every month. And then there's the guest books we have to read, which don't count towards the every other week. So once you map it out, it gets pretty crazy. You're not going to double up? No, we like never, double count. I never double up. I've never doubled up. No, if it guest is a guest. I mean, you read the guest books too. You're reading just as much as I am. Um, anyways, in the store, keep asking for your free toque. There's still some left. Just put a note at checkout. Every order gets a free pair of socks. Lots of orders coming in that are getting the 50% off for people that are reaching the 
halfway mark in the 22 and 22 challenge. So it's nice to see even people hopping on, getting something at half price, get the free socks and they get the free toque. So it's a pretty good bundle, pretty good value. Hmm. I, I did want to say we've we've gotten some really nice feedback on our uh, crypto episodes, both in the Rash Reminder community and the comments on the videos. It's uh, mm-hmm. It's been really well well received i think so that's that's been nice to see uh and people are watching them and listening to them like the the download numbers for those episodes have been as high or higher than our regular rational minder episodes um and i mean we didn't try to time this or anything but it's it's timely because obviously if anyone's paying attention to crypto market valuations uh it's been it's been pretty spicy um so i'm I'm, (laughs) Wouldn't be surprised if people are looking for, uh, I don't know, sober information on the on the topic. Uh, anyway, so we're we're happy that it's been well received so far, and we're looking forward to continue uh, releasing those episodes. Agree. All right, let's uh, let's get to the episode. Welcome to episode two hundred and five of the Rational Minder Podcast for this week's book review. It's something that came up. I listened to a couple of podcasts lately. One might have been Invest Like the Best with Patrick O'Shaughnessy, I believe. I'm not even sure what guest it was, to be honest. But this book came up a couple times. I thought I'd go back and check it out. I'd heard about it before. It's a book by James P. Kars called Finite and Infinite Games, A Vision of Life as Play and Possibility. And I first heard it, heard about this book when I read Simon Sinek's book, The Infinite Game, which I know we've reviewed in the past. And he he really raved about the book in his book. And then he also interviewed James Cars in his podcast in late December 2020, just before the author passed away. And it's a it's a wonderful interview, really nice guy. And the book is a wonderfully written, easy read, but his language is so creative. And I, I just found it a really beautiful book to read. And it's one of those books where you could easily reread it, you know, every couple of years. I liked it that much. So James P. Kars was an academic and professor of literature and religion at New York University. He retired back in 1996 and he wrote the book in 1986. So this book was the inspiration for Cynic's book, The Infinite Game. And the main point again, similar to Cynic's book, is that there are two kinds of games. One is called finite and the other is infinite. The finite game is played with the objective of winning and the infinite game is for the purpose of playing, not necessarily for winning. So a finite game always has a winner and it comes to a definitive end, usually in a defined amount of time. And since and this is what he talks about. Since finite games are played to be won, players do everything they can and have been trained for to win. Anything not done to win is typically not part of the game. I mean, you think you were, a, a, I guess, a pro basketball player, right? You practiced so many times, and I can imagine that you imagine how the victories of games would go, right? But it's a known amount of time, known agreed upon rules, And the only thing that wasn't known when the game started was who would win it. And that causes all kinds of super fun drama in watching a game where people have practiced, you know, the proverbial 10,000 hours or more in order to be masters at that game. And it makes it very exciting. However, it's not necessarily that creative. So um, finite games are much more dramatic. He talks at length about that. The ending is known However, who will win is not known. Um, This is a big difference though with infinite games. Finite players are trained not only to anticipate and practice every future possibility, but also to control the possibility. You and basketball were trained at all sorts of different moves, right? Infinite players continue to play the game differently, which is to look forward to surprises and then the subsequent creativity to keep playing the game. Also, infinite games have many unknown players. Like you think in business, right? You don't know who your competitors are going to be. You don't know how your customers are going to react. You don't know what sort of 
experiments such as this podcast, for example, what kind of impact this could have on the game that we're playing here. So infinite players prepare themselves to be surprised by the future. They play in complete transparency, he talks about. Totally vulnerable to what might transpire. How the game rolls out is not known. Therefore, they're vulnerable to the game, not just to their skills as a master or a pro in a finite game. So training is highly needed, of course, in a finite game. In an infinite game, what you need, he, he explains, is education, resilience, and openness, hmm. which is I, I found that super interesting. Mm -hmm. Infinite game continues past one player's death. This just causes other players to figure out how to keep playing. Infinite players play for the game. Finite players play to end the game. Such an interesting paradox. A powerful person is one who brings greatness to a finite game, a master or a professional. There are very few of them, but anyone can bring and be a strong person in an infinite game. So get this as an interesting quote. Strength is paradoxical. I am not strong because I can force others to do what I wish as a result of my play with them, but because I can allow them to do what they wish in the course of my play with them. Every move an infinite player makes is towards the horizon, but you can never reach the horizon. Every move made by a finite player is within a boundary. Every moment an infinite game therefore presents a new vision, a new range of possibilities. He also had a really cool quote on culture. And culture, whenever I'm asked, like, what's our culture? I find it, for me, difficult to explain. Here's how he explains culture. Since a culture is not anything person, so this is how he wrote it. Since a culture is not anything persons do, but anything they do with each other, we may say that a culture comes into being whenever persons cho choose to be a people. It is as a people that they arrange their rules with each other, their moralities, their modes of communication. Hmm. Time does not pass for an infinite player. Each moment of time is a beginning. And another quote here. An infinite player does not begin working for the purpose of filling up a period of time with work, but for the purpose of filling work with time. This gets back to the whole creativity thing, and I think it links back to your paper on life satisfaction and happiness. So the final quote for you, one never reaches a horizon. It is not a line. It has no place. It encloses no field. Its location is always relative to the view. To move toward a horizon is simply to have a new horizon. One can therefore never be close to one's horizon, though one may certainly have a short range of vision, a narrow horizon. Really enjoyed the book. We think about this a lot. Um, our book club at work kicks off this week. We're actually talking about Cynic's book, The Infinite Game, but this is a great um, support and actually inspired Cynic to write that book. Highly recommend it. Cool. I never played professional basketball, by the way. I played NCAA basketball. It's near pro. I mean, it's near professional level, though. I suppose that the, the, what do you call it, the filter, like the number of people that go from NCAA Division I to, to professional is still, is still right. pretty small. But the point still stands. You practiced. Yes. Like crazy. Yes. It and is it, true. And it's safe to assume that you would imagine how the game would be Everything you said is correct. I just never played professionally. It depends how you define professionally, too. Yeah. Technically, I was never professional by NCAA rules, okay. but I was paid a lot of money for tuition and stuff like that indirectly. Right. Okay, <laughs> very high-level competitive basketball. How's that? Yes, but I'm point, more comfortable with that. The point still stands. I, I only point that out because it was always a, a goal of mine was always to play professional basketball, and I never did. So when you said that, I oh, was sorry. like, well, All right, I didn't mean to. Okay upset you <laughs> i'll be okay <laughs> all right you want to head on to recent news about meta yeah there are a few a few good little uh news items that i wanted to talk about so uh, apparently meta uh is is soon going to be a value stock imagine that no. wasn't that long ago that we were no. talking about uh the large cap growth companies now they can't go up forever and all that kind of stuff and uh well there you go just look at the price um, now, 165 right now. 52-week high was 384. 
Yeah, unreal. So FTSE Russell's latest, and I haven't looked for an update of this. This is an article that I saw on FT.com. Uh, but FTSE Russell's latest updates on the two-month process on, on index reconstitution indicate that Meta will probably account for 1.8% of the value index once the reconstitution goes into effect at the end of trading on June 24th. Mm-hmm. And it'll be 0.49% of the growth index. Um, so it's kind of straddling, I guess, but it's... Uh, it's in the value index. Now, I, I, we've talked about this many times. This is this is interesting, but it's not unexpected by any means. Uh, I always come back to Fama and French's 2007 paper, Migration, where they showed how value and growth stocks have historically behaved in, in their sample uh, after becoming value and growth stock. So what, what happens to a growth stock after it becomes a growth stock and what happens to a value stock after it becomes a value stock? Um, so quotes from there, that, that classic paper, uh, the, the high expected profitability and growth combined with low expected returns, discount rates, uh, to produce high price to book ratios for growth stocks. That's when they get added to the portfolio. Uh, well, low profitability, slow growth and high expected returns, high discount rates is what creates uh, low price to book for value stocks. Um, but then over time, competition from other firms tends to erode the high profitability of growth stocks and profitability declines as they exercise their most profitable growth options. So each year, some growth stocks cease to be highly profitable, fast-growing firms uh, that are rewarded by the market with low discount rates. So they their profitability and, and growth options are, are depleted, and at the same time, their discount rates increase. So valuations start to um, converge. As a result, price-to-book ratios of growth portfolios tend to fall in the years after portfolio formation. Conversely, the price-to-book ratios of value portfolios tend to rise in the years after portfolio formation. As some value firms restructure, their profitability improves and they're rewarded by the market with lower discount rates. So their valuations increase. It's like for growth stocks, sometimes fundamentals get worse and valuation uh, multiples decline. And for value stocks, the opposite thing happens. And that's where the premiums come from, or a big chunk of it, that uh, convergence in price to book. Yeah, exactly. So interesting headline, but not necessarily surprising. And there could be other stocks as well. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the, the what constitutes a value portfolio, you know, in uh, six months or whatever. Uh, I also wanted to t- touch on a, a nice article that Cliff had, uh, like speaking of tech uh, with respect to the value. Uh, Cliff had a post explaining that the value spread, uh, that's the valuation spread between growth and value stocks, is not all about tech stocks. And that's Cliff Asness, by the way, for those who don't know. Yes, Cliff Asness, who leads AQR. He's been a guest on the podcast. He's also been very, uh, he's been pretty pretty snappy on Twitter (laughs) recently. I don't know if you've been following him. Oh, I love it when he's back. I know he went off Twitter for a while. Oh, he's, he's a bit aggressive for my tastes, but hey, it's, it's still fun to watch, I guess. Uh, okay, so I, I think that there's a common perception that uh, that the, the growth versus value uh, story over the last decade or so has been all about tech. Like tech, tech is what is causing value to outperform. And if you're overweight value, you're underweight tech, which is true. Uh, but that's not necessarily the whole story. And if you look at the value strategies that AQR runs and the dimensional runs that, that we use, they're within industry value portfolios. So industry weights are capped and companies are re-weighted within industries to create the value tilt. And there's evidence, I can't remember the paper off the top of my head, but there's evidence that that is how you get the value premium. Uh, so that uh, that makes sense to do it that way. Uh, now that's important though, because if value is fully explained by tech, or if growth is fully explained by tech, then uh, that that within industry tilt is uh, less interesting to talk about. Um, but it's, it's also important to mention, I guess, that AQR strategies are, are typically long short. Well, of course, dimensional is long only. Uh, so in the dimensional portfolios, you do still have growth, whereas in a AQR long short factor pro- portfolio, you, you wouldn't. Um, yeah, so it, it, in this post, he shows that the current industry neutral value spread, so that's the reweighting within industries, not across industries, is at its 95th percentile of expensiveness relative to its own history. And we can put that chart in the in the video, but it's wow. it's right up there. 
So value is still historically cheap relative to its own history since 1990. Uh, it's U.S. value. But then he looks at a tech index versus the S&P 500. So the, the value spread between tech and the S&P 500, which is just meant to illustrate the relative valuation of the tech industry. It's only at its 84th percentile of uh, spread relative to its own history. Even after these price declines. Well, after the price declines is, well, yes, right. So it's still high, right, is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So it's, the prices have come down a lot, but it's still, it's still pretty expensive. Um, so why that's interesting is that, I, I mean, uh, tech, tech's come down a bunch, like you say, Cameron, in, in relative price. So that spread has compressed a little bit. Um, but across all industries, value is still very cheap relative to growth. So it just shows you, even though tech's gotten hammered recently, relative to value, growth is still expensive across industry. Mm-hmm. So it's more than just a, more than just a tech story. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is interesting there is that tech, now that the valuations have compressed, expected returns are a little bit higher, but that doesn't mean that expected returns on value are no longer high. So tech has higher expected returns, yes. Um, but that doesn't mean that value has become less attractive across all industries. Yep. I thought that was it. interesting to to mention mm-hmm. because I think that that narrative of, of value versus tech is pretty strong. I uh, also wanted to touch on David Blitz had a new paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management where he looked at expected stock returns when interest rates are low. And I thought this was worth mentioning because it's something that we've mentioned a few times on the podcast, just the idea that if uh, interest rates are low, then expected returns are also low because you're earning a risk premium over the risk-free rate. So if the risk-free rate is lower, your expected return should be lower, assuming a constant risk premium. But this paper looks at that and finds that it's not actually the not actually the case. So they, they looked at that empirically, and they actually strongly reject the hypothesis that a higher risk-free return uh, implies higher total average stock returns, which is what you'd expect. If it's a constant risk premium and the risk-free rate goes up, you'd expect a higher uh, stock return. But they find that that is not the case. Uh, so kind of kind of neat. And there's a chart that we can put in the in the video that shows the total returns and how they break down over time between the risk-free return and the equity risk premium. But the equity risk premium is is not constant in uh, in their sample, and they find that the result holds for the U.S. market as well as most international stock markets, with Japan being the one uh, anomaly where it kind of looks how you might theoretically expect. Um, and it's also robust uh, when they include control factors like CAPE was the big one that they use, but they use other other control factors. Uh, so their their conclusion is that expected total stock returns seem to be unrelated or maybe a little bit inversely related to the level of the risk-free return. Right. Count- counterintuitive, like that's not, not what you'd expect. Um, the, the, so the equity risk premium tends to be higher when the risk-free rate is low and oh. lower when it's high. But it's a pretty weak relationship. You'll, you can see in the in the chart that we'll, that we'll post, it's probably safer to say that it's unrelated. Um, and, and their suggestion is that it, it stems from the operating performance of firms relative to rates, not from multiple expansion or risk-based explanations. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, but they importantly don't find that this information could be used as a market timing signal uh, because the equity risk premium is still positive in all risk-free rate scenarios. But it is contrary to, uh, to conventional wisdom. So anyway, I, I learned something from that paper. It, I mean, I always had the model of, you know, the risk premium is relatively constant, and so a risk-free rate goes up, your your expected total return goes up. Hmm. But they're saying that that's empirically not the case. Yeah, it's interesting <clears throat> your comment. You can't market time around it because the premiums are still expected to be positive. So leaving that asset class wouldn't make sense is what you're saying because it's yeah, not like it has you, a negative premium. Exactly. So you can't time your exposure based right. on the risk-free rate, but adjust your expectations down as the risk-free rate increases. A, a little bit, but that's the, that's the part where it's like, 
how how strong is that relationship and how predictive is that relationship? I'm not I'm not sure. When you look at the when you look at the comparison of total returns over time, uh, there's not an obvious uh, right. not an obvious pattern. Neat. Yeah, I just thought it was cool. Okay, Canadian Social Survey. Yeah, did you see this? Did you know that this existed? I did not. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of don't know exist. Canada's like it. That's a that that's some uh, puts Canada in some kind of leadership position with respect to what we know about our citizens. I think so. Canada has a quality of life framework. Uh, it was it was publicly released in Budget 2021 alongside uh, federal budget investments aimed at strengthening national data sets and better incorporating quality of life measurements into decision making and budgeting. That's awesome. I'm glad I'm glad we're doing that. <laughs> right. It is. It's good. Um, so they, they released data recently on life satisfaction and meaning and purpose for Canadians based on a recent set of surveys that they, that they conducted. Uh, the surveys are all available online. If you want to look at the questions that they were asking people and you can sort the data by province and a bunch of other socio demographic characteristics. Uh, so they measured life satisfaction on a scale from zero to 10. Uh, respondents were asked using a scale of zero to 10, where zero means very dissatisfied and 10 means very satisfied. How do you feel about your life as a whole right now? So it's kind of like the Cantrell ladder concept that we've talked about mm -hmm. before. Uh, and they also asked about sense of meaning and purpose, which is measured again on a scale of zero one z from zero to 10. Uh, respondents were asked using a scale from zero to 10, where zero means not at all and 10 means completely. To what extent do you feel things you do in your life are worthwhile? So that's the, that's the setup for the data that we'll talk about briefly here. Uh, across Canada, they found that 51.7% of people rate their life satisfaction as an 8, 9, or 10. By province, and this is interesting, Newfoundland had the most people with life satisfaction at 8, 9, eight, nine or 10, at 61.7% of people. And British Columbia had the least at 46.5%. Uh, Newfoundland also has the most frequent response of sense of meaning with a 8, 9, or 10 rating, 66.1% of people uh, in the survey. And, and BC had the lowest at 54.6%. Wow. Um, now, why I found this particularly interesting is that on other metrics like median income being the one that I think is quite interesting as an observation, BC is at the higher end, uh, not the highest, but it's at the higher end. Uh, it's above the national median. And Newfoundland is at the lower end. Again, not the lowest, but it's at the lower end um, of the Canadian provinces. And that's based on 2020 census data. So it's just kind of neat. Kind of shows that relationship of the, the wealthier province is not necessarily happier. And in this case, it's actually quite a bit less happy. Um, and then on the socio-demographic sorts, uh, retired people have high li higher life satisfaction than working people. 60.1% of people gave the 8, 9, or 10 for life satisfaction uh, versus 51.7, which is the same as the sample average for uh, working people. Uh, but they have a, a similar frequency of a strong sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, and then uh, with that data point, li living in Newfoundland is a better predictor of life satisfaction and sense of meaning and purpose than being retired. That was kind of neat. Uh, that was just my observation. Um, pe people in rural areas are more frequently reporting high life satisfaction. 57.6% uh, of people in rural areas compared to 50.6% in population centers. That's not surprising. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot, a lot of the data points are consistent with, uh, with other research. Uh, people in rural areas, rural areas also have a stronger sense of meaning and purpose with 65% of people giving the 8, 9, or 10 versus 57.5 for urban areas. Um, but I also found it interesting. There are studies going back as far as 1999, maybe earlier, showing that Newfoundland is an outlier with respect to life satisfaction. And uh, I mean, anecdotally, <laughs> I can say having spent a, a decent chunk of time visiting Newfoundland and having grown up in in BC, I, 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 can, I, can, I get it. I can see, I can Absolutely. see it. Absolutely. The, the, the pace and feel are, are just super, uh, super different. Yep. And same for the, the rural versus population center life. Um, those findings didn't surprise me. They're based on my own 
anecdotal experience. I agree. Interesting stuff. Okay, main topic this week is private equity. Yeah, I thought we'd talk about private equity. We've, we've seen more and more um, people asking us about it and, and getting pitched on private equity funds as an investment. Uh, Vanguard's even gotten into the private equity game. Um, they, they've started making private equity available to some of their retail customers, and it's still a pretty high uh, net worth threshold to access, um, but it's there. The, the way Vanguard explains it in, in a white paper uh, is that private equity's significant illiquidity and market dynamics provide suitable investors the opportunity to earn long-term excess returns while increasing portfolio diversification through expanded equity market coverage. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it does, it does sound good. Yep. And it, it even sounds theoretically uh, consistent that, that illiquid assets uh, in markets that are more difficult to access would have higher expected returns and opportunities for managers to add, to add value, um, maybe even enough value to justify their fees, which in private equity are fairly high. Uh, estimates that account for everything, because there are a lot of different layers of fees, uh, in, in private equity, uh, estimates in a single number are, are around 6%. So you're paying equivalent to approximately 6% per year in fees to own private equity as an asset class. And again, that's through a whole bunch of different layers and types of fees, but it, it roughly comes out to 6% as, a, as an estimate. Um, so sounds pretty good theoretically, but there's a big empirical question there, which has been hard to answer. Uh, not, not for me, but for the people who have done the research. Uh, so it's an empirical question. Does, does private equity outperform public equity net of fees? So that's, uh, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, now, evaluating the performance of private equity is, is hard. And that's why I said it's been a difficult question for the researchers to answer. Uh, illiquid assets with lumpy cash flows, which is what private equity investments are, can't be compared to the performance of a public equity index. Um, so often, IRRs, internal rates of return, are used to evaluate uh, private equity performance, but they're not comparable to the typical time-weighted rates of return that most investors are familiar with. So you can't really take a private equity IRR and compare it to uh, the performance of the U.S. market, for example. Uh, the 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 math is just very, very different, and it would be a very misleading comparison to make. Uh, the the IRR is is technically the discount rate that makes the net present value of all cash flows equal to zero in a discounted cash flow analysis. Now, the way the math works is particularly problematic because if you think about uh, any, any large private equity firm uh, or private equity firms in general, one thing that they're going to have in common typically is early success. So you think about like Blackstone had the, the historic Hilton deal where they made uh, billions of dollars for, for investors. Deals like that are what create the foundation for firms that will go on to be successful private equity firms. Now those early successes, because of the way that the IRR calculation works, set those firms up to have uh, very sticky IRRs that stay, stay at a high level. Uh, and it's very difficult to change them even if later returns are not as not as good or later uh, investor cash flows are not as good. So that's interesting. And actually, if you look at the big private equity firms, if you look at like Apollo's reported in, in their SEC filings, IRRs, uh, KKR, same same type of idea. The since inception IRRs are, are basically, basically constant numbers um, in all of their filings over many years. Uh, and that's because of the way the math works. It's like anchored on the early success and very, very difficult to move after that. So that does not drift down over time? That's what I'm saying. It'll stick. It's sticky. The IRRs are very, very sticky. Unless there's like a total uh, blow up or disaster, you'd expect that IRR to stay constant. So the challenge for investors is if you look at the IRR, it's not telling you a whole lot about uh, what the recent returns have been or even what the returns have been relative to the market. Like, would you have been better off investing in this private equity fund or the market? The IRR makes it look like you would have been better off in the private equity fund, 
but they're not comparable numbers at all. And you're likely to only be presented with high IRRs, I'm guessing. Well, yes, but I also think that their survivorship here is huge, yeah. right? Like the firms that are early on successful are the firms that are going to stick around and the firms that have these high sticky IRRs to, to recommend. So a lot of this comes from Ludovic um, Falipu, who, who we'll talk to uh, in, in the next little while. And he, he's very passionate about the, uh, what, how misleading the IRRs can be. Um, anyway, so I don't, I don't think most investors understand this. You see a, a 39% IRR and it's like, hey, that, that is great. I want that. Right. Of course. And like you said, Cameron, they're, they're in the pitch decks from private equity investments. Like here's our since inception IRR. Wow, twenty six percent. Wow, thirty nine percent. Like I, I want, I want that in my portfolio. But it's super important to understand you cannot compare the thirty nine percent IRR to the equity market return. Um, the calculations are are just too, too different, and often in the case of IRR skewed ter- toward early successes. So we need better tools to evaluate private equity, and, and fortunately, there are some. Uh, one of them is multiple of money. So you just take the sum of all cash inflows uh, and divide that by the sum of all cash outflows, uh, and that gives you the multiple, uh, the multiple on your money invested. And of course, that has lots of gaps in it too. But it's it's just one other tool. So you can look at IRRs, you can look at uh, multiple of money, and it's interesting, right? Because if you look at the IRR and it's fifty percent, but the multiple of money is one point five percent, well, okay, well, that tells you a lot about the informational content of the of the IRR. And then the other one is uh, the Kaplan Shore PME. It was introduced in a 2005 paper. PME is the public market equivalent. Um, So it's a net present value calculation. It compares the results generated by a private equity strategy to those generated by investing the same cash flows in a benchmark index. Um, And it gives you a a number. So it'll, like for example, the PME, if it's 1.2, that tells you that the private equity strategy beat the benchmark by 20% cumulative over the holding period. And then you can back out what the annualized return difference is from that if you want to. Um, now, the thing about PME is that it's very sensitive to its benchmark. Um, so like a PME of 1.2 relative to the S&P 500, you don't know if that's private equity alpha or if it's just a small cap premium because you're comparing it to the S&P 500 and so. private equity investments will tend to be smaller smaller companies. Now, the other thing that's kind of tricky in looking at all of this data, these data is that uh, one of the benchmarks that's often used, to re- recognizing what I just said, one of the benchmarks that's often used in the place of the S&P 500 or as an alternative benchmark is the Russell 2000. Now, the Russell 2000 has some real big problems. Um, it is it's performed terribly. And this is a thing that's well known in investment management. Like if you want to build a small cap strategy that beats the benchmark, you can just benchmark it against the Russell 2000 and the rest is easy. That's kind of a joke, but it's a little bit true. Um, From 1994 through April, 2020, the Russell 2000 returned an annualized, that must be April, 2022. Anyway, I, I, the, the, the relative numbers are what matter. So for this long period of time that I pulled the data for, uh, the Russell 2000 returned an annualized 8.66%, while the S&P small cap 600 index returned 10.44%. Uh, the dimensional US small cap index returned 11.58%. And over the same period, the S&P 500 re- returned 10.11%. Right. So the important thing here is that if we're comparing PMEs, like how did private equity do relative to uh, a, a benchmark, and you're looking at, okay, well, the S&P 500 over this period did 10.1%. Um, okay, let's use a small cap index. But the rest of 2000 over the same period returned 8.66%. So it's not gonna, it's not necessarily going to help you adjust for any uh, size premium. But the other important thing there is that there was a size premium over this period. Like the dimensional small cap index beats the S&P 500 by uh, about 1.5%. Right. It's just that the Russell 2000... <laughs> did did really poorly um so that can be misleading too and to beat this you still have to get over your fee bogey yes so pmes would typically be calculated as a net of fee number so you're using net cash flows to arrive at the right 
at the PME. But yes, you're right. The, the fee hurdle is is uh, still big to overcome. Uh, so some of these other papers use the Russell 2000 value index, which is a little bit better. But again, it's still it's still pretty pretty rough. Like the over the same period, 94 to 20. Um, 20, the uh, Russ 2000 value returns 9.57% and the dimensional U.S. small cap value index returns 13.04%. Right. Um, so it's kind of, it, it's choosing the, that index choice is kind of handicapping the index, which I think leads to an overstatement of PMEs. And, and we'll see more about that in, uh, in a minute. But that's the kind of the, the framework to think about evaluating private equity, equity performance. Um, there's a 2020 paper, Private Equity Performance, What Do We Know? Uh, they look at the performance of almost 1,400 buyout and venture capital funds. So that's like leveraged buyout um, and, and venture capital. They use data from a data provider called Burgess. This is the other thing that you find out about when you start looking at private equity. There's a few major data providers. Um, they've all got different sources. Um, different research looks at different data providers. What one of the papers that I looked at looks at all three data providers and suggests that they're all unbiased um, and that they're all good data sources. But it's interesting. Like private equity data is understandably not as good and clean as public equity data, mm -hmm. which just, just makes sense. Anyway, so in this paper, they find outperformance relative to the S&P 500 of 20%, so PME of 1.2 for buyout funds. Uh, and they say that's equivalent to more than 3% per year excess return relative to the S&P 500. And then they also test it against the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, the Russell 2000 value. And they find that their outperformance results are robust, but keeping in, one, in mind what I just said about the, the Russell small cap indexes. Uh, they find that venture capital funds in the U.S. outperformed public equities in the 1990s, but have underperformed uh, public equities in the most recent decade. The sample median... Uh, buyout fund. So the, the sample average was 1.2. The sample median is 1.11. And then for venture funds, and this is this is pretty important, the, the sample average PME is 1.2, but the sample median for venture is 0 0.88. Wow. So the average sample average is 1.2 for venture capital, but if you get the median fund, you're underperforming public equities pretty substantially. So that's uh, relative, Massive skewness in, in venture capital. Uh, yeah, huge, huge, huge dispersion in venture capital uh, returns. And that, that's particularly important for venture capital based on the persistence data, which, which we'll talk more about in a second. Um, ch changing the benchmark to the Russell 2000, the sample average PME for buyouts does drop down a little bit to 1.11 uh, and the median down to, or, uh, sorry, the, the sample average to 1.07 for the Russell 2000 value. But again, you can say like, we're using the worst small cap and small cap value indexes out there, but the PMEs are still dropping down closer to one. And like we saw how much better the numbers are for the other small cap indexes a minute ago, you would expect the PME to drop down even, even lower, um, which other research talks about that I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Now for venture, the sample average PMEs are well above one for all benchmarks but the sample medians are all well below one. Wow. So again, massive skewness. And, you know, Bill Janeway talked to us about this. There's, there's a big adverse selection problem in venture capital. Like it probably makes more sense for most investors to think about the median VC return, not the, not the mean average, because uh, the funds that are driving the mean are funds that you probably can't access. So the best VC funds do tend to perform exceptionally well. There's a lot of skewness, but you probably can't access uh, the best funds. Uh, the, the other thing in this paper that's important for uh, in investors today to think about is that both absolute performance and performance relative to public markets are negatively related to aggregate capital commitments for both buyout and VC. And 2021 was a massive year for capital raising in both private equity and venture capital. Uh, so then there's a, a follow-up paper that they did. You know what, I think I said that private equity performance, what do we know is a 2020 paper, that's a 2014 paper. Uh, so a 2020 follow-up paper has persistence persisted in private equity, uh, evidence from buyout and venture capital funds. 
the authors update the performance data from the previous paper, and they ask if there's persistence in performance for private equity funds. Uh, they find that post-2000, uh, buyout funds have modest persistence, but it's driven by the persistence of the worst performing funds. So that's interesting. There is persistence, but it's in the worst performing funds. So the bad ones bet keep on being bad. <laughs> right. So you can, you, can not, you can choose not to pick the worst performing funds, um, and that'll be persistent, but... It is a strategy. In the top, right. <laughs> in the top three quartiles of performance, uh, there's no statistical difference in future performance among funds previously in the top three quartiles. Huh. So if you look at the best buyout managers uh, and only invest in those, you're not increasing your chances of getting top quartile performance in the future. Now in venture, they do find persistence of the top performing funds, um, which is interesting. But I think even then, even though there is persistence in the top performing funds, it's <laughs> it's tricky to even know which ones are are the best performing funds. So there's another paper, are too many private equity funds top quartile? Uh, the authors in that paper find using three major data sources and applying metrics typically adopted in the private equity industry that even modest variations in methodology can result in half of all funds being able to claim top quartile results. So that's a little tricky. <laughs> okay. I think this is it's a it's a problem. I think it's a recognized problem in in private markets that there's um uh, the, the disclosure and the reporting is, is not systematized to a point where you can actually understand what's going on in the market, which is a big challenge, obviously, for investors, and it requires a whole different level of due, uh, due diligence to participate. But yeah, anyway, so it's, it's easy to say that you invest in top quartile funds, but there's a chance that they're not actually top quartile, even though they can show with their own data that they are. Uh, okay, so in, in those papers, in, in those two papers, the 2014... Uh, paper, Private Equity Performance, What Do We Know? And the 2020 paper, Has Persistence Persisted in Private Equity? Uh, they, they together paint a, a reasonably rosy picture, I think. Uh, keeping them, I mean, th those papers don't talk about the problems with using the Russell indexes as a, as a secondary benchmark. But if you forget about that, if you, if you don't know that information, um, both buyout and venture capital look quite compelling um, from the perspective of delivering PMEs above, above one. So if you're an investor looking at that and you want returns in excess of what public equities can deliver, they look like attractive asset classes. Uh, but then in Ludovic Falipu's research, so he's got a 2020 paper, An Inconvenient Fact, Private Equity Returns and the Billionaire Factory. He shows that the historical performance of private equity in aggregate uh, and leveraged buyouts on their own, so he separates them out uh, from, he looks at multiple data vendors as well. Uh, from Burgess data, so that's one of the uh, data providers, same as yep. the one in the previous papers. Um, the PMEs are below one for private equity in aggregate and slightly above one for leveraged buyouts in, uh, in his sample. Uh, multiples of money for private equity are 1.57, buyouts are 1.65. Now that's similar to public equity indexes over the same period. Uh, Ludovic also presents the PME data for three different providers, I think, um, and different data providers. I guess these are all, they must all be, I haven't used any of them, but they must all be softwares that you can kind of explore the data in uh, because he says that the data providers, different data providers allow the use of different benchmarks to calculate the PME. So like they would have it built into their software to select these different benchmark in indexes. So because of that, he shows uh, varying benchmarks to show PMEs and they don't all have small cap and some of them have Russell, some of them have S&P, but whatever. Um, but the trend is that for vintages from 1996 to 2005, uh, private equity has delivered PMEs well above one when you compare it to the S&P 500, but only slightly above one compared to like the S&P uh, small cap 600 index, or he also uses the dimensional micro cap fund as a benchmark. And his suggestion in his papers is that that's, that's probably a pretty good benchmark to uh, private equities because it's a live fund that's been around for a long time and it holds uh, the cl closer to the types of capitalization that private equity funds would hold. More recent vintages, so 2006 to 2015, uh, private equity in aggregate has trailed small cap public equities uh, and buyout funds have had a very small, very small edge. Uh, so he shows that the, the, the reported private equity multiples of money 
of five pension funds from uh, from investments that they had made between 2006 and 2015, and this is just from public reporting. Um, the multiples of money are similar across all pension funds, which is interesting, um, and they're similar to the aggregate Burgess data that we saw in, in the in the data that I was talking about at the beginning of, of this paper. Uh, and, and then, of course, they're also very similar to the public equity indexes over the same period. So this is kind of his thesis in the paper is that like, well, look, it's it's one time period, but he's saying that, look, from the 2006, 2015 vintages, uh, you would have been just as uh, done just as well in public equities as he did in in uh, private equities. Hmm. Uh, the last data that he reports or that I'm going to report from his paper is from the big four private equity firms. So from Apollo, Blackstone, Carlisle, and KKR. And he finds that their net multiples of money for the 2006 to 2015 vintages are remarkably similar to the aggregate data. And in the video, we can put charts for, for all these, um, which are, like I've been saying, not a whole lot different from public equities over the same period. Uh, and, and he also points out that... <laughs> And this is, you know, his title is pretty provocative, The Billionaire Factory. But that's one of, one of his big messages uh, is that while private equity as an asset class has not delivered much, if any, value to investors net of fees relative to public equities, private equity as an industry has minted 19 new billionaires from 2005 through 2020. So, of course, these are not investors in the PE funds, but the people running the PE funds. That you know that that sounds like a, it's supposed to be kind of a shocking, a shocking figure. I don't think it's actually surprising though. Um, gross of fees, the private equity funds are are delivering substantial value. Net of fees, they're not. They're absorbing all of the uh, the economic rents from their skill are being absorbed by the managers, not by their investors, which is what you'd expect. We've, we've talked before yeah. about the two, 2004 Burke and Green paper, mutual fund flows and performance in rational markets. Uh, you would expect that skilled managers would grow their funds to the point that their investors don't benefit from their skill, uh, that investors end up earning returns commensurate with the risk they're taking, and the fund managers are the ones that reap the benefits of their skill by charging fees and a larger asset base. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty good theoretical framework, and I think that's probably what's happening. <laughs> like the private equity managers are skilled. They are delivering substantial gross of fee uh, excess returns. It's just net of fees. You're not... <laughs> You don't get to keep it, right? Uh, which is exactly what you'd expect from the economics of that arrangement, right? Yeah, so I think Ludovic is kind of saying this is a big deal and this is bad, and and you know look how look at all these billionaires, but it's kind of like well they're they're actually kind of right. They're 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 kind of earning it. Yeah, they're kind of earning it. It's just they're keeping all of the profits. Yep, and I think part of his Ludovic's whole thing is that the, the the contracts should be structured better to favor limited partners as opposed to being so beneficial for general partners. Anyway, we we can talk to him more about that, but it is it is all very very interesting. Uh, okay, so if if it is true that the that the manager managers are absorbing the benefits of their skill through their fees, and that the investors are just getting returns commensurate with the risk they're taking. That still leaves open the possibility that private equity is delivering risk exposures that you could not alternatively get in public markets. So even if you know you can access PE as an asset class, and even net of fees, you're getting some cool asset class exposures, that can still be very interesting. So that's the next question you have to ask: is what what risk exposures are you actually getting by owning private equity? One of the com common arguments that we saw off the top, uh, Vanguard has also made is that there's an illiquidity premium where by owning illiquid assets, you expect to earn higher returns by supplying capital to these illiquid investments for locking your capital up. And of course, private equity is illiquid. Uh, that's a pretty good theoretical argument that there's an illiquidity premium. Uh, but in the paper, Demystifying Illiquid Assets, Expected Returns for Private Equity, uh, the authors explain, and Cliff, Cliff Asnes has also written about this, uh, mm -hmm. and the authors of this paper are actually from uh, AQR as well, uh, they, they explain that while there may be that theoretical risk-based illiquidity premium, in practice, it's th there's a good chance that it's largely offset by investor willingness to overpay for the return smoothing effects of illiquid assets. Can you imagine? <laughs> no, that's a funny one. It's, it's an interesting one to think about. So it's like, 
private equity assets are not marked to market. So if, if we sell a client a private equity investment, it's valued whatever it is quarterly. Um, and that results in like on investment statements. Well, there's, there's a whole thing on Twitter about this recently where I was a cliff cliff was cliff was the one tweeting about it where, where there's a, 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 a private equity fund or a hedge fund or something that they, they had said that, you know, their public equities were down this amount over the quarter, but their private equities were down, whatever, much less. And Cliff was all enraged saying like, you, you, that's ridiculous just because you haven't valued the private equities over this reporting period. Uh, but he does a great job, by the way, describing all that in a podcast, The Long View with uh, Christine Benz. It's a, mm. it's a live podcast they recorded at the Morningstar conference, so it's easy to find. And Cliff talks in the back half of that interview exactly about this phenomenon in this paper. It was a really good interview. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so the, the, the effect is that if, if an investment manager wants to make their returns look smoother to keep their clients happy and keep their clients in their seats, which may not even be a bad motivation. Like maybe that's maybe that's good. Maybe we should retor- re- report our returns less, and people will be better off. We talked to John List about John that. John List said exactly that. Last yeah, week. yeah. Um, so if enough investment managers have this preference for illiquid assets because it makes returns look smoother, then they're and they're effectively willing to overpay for that smoothing effect. Uh, that could completely or or partially offset. Uh, any notion of a risk-based illiquidity, illiquidity premium. So I think Cliff, Cliff's uh, racy tidy for, title for his blog post about this, his 2019 blog post, is the illiquidity discount. <laughs> it's kind of kind of funny. Now, there's actually a 2014 paper uh, that looks at the true diversification effect of private equity, because this is the other, the other argument, right, is, is that there's a diversifying effect uh, but again, that ties back to the reported uh, returns, which, because of the smoothing, are going to look like diversifying assets relative to public equities. Uh, so this 2014 paper, Private Equities Diversification Illusion, Economic Co-Movement and Fair Value Reporting, uh, finds that while private equity managers, <laughs> pension fund managers, and investment advisors assert that private equity investments diversify investor portfolios, it's really cost-based methods of accounting that underestimate the systematic risk of private equity, which creates this illusion of diversification. And they use for their analysis, it's kind of interesting, uh, European private equity funds were required to switch to ver- fair value reporting at, at some point. Uh, and when that happened, reported correlations between accounting-based private equity returns and those of public equity increased hmm. a lot. And private equity funds uh, found it more difficult to access capital after that happened. Um, kind of kind of interesting. Uh, so the authors of Demystifying Illiquid Assets Expected Returns for Private Equity find that compared to a risk-appropriate benchmark, so they say, uh, kind of like we were just talking about, you can't just look at the, you can't look at the risk of private equities based on their reported returns. You have to either de-smooth the returns or, or take some other approach to measure the risk. Uh, so they find a risk-appropriate benchmark for public equities and find that uh, against that benchmark, there's no evidence of an illiquidity premium. Uh, but th- it, it could still be possible that private equity investors are getting really good access to stuff like the size and value uh, premiums. And then, of course, the next question is, are you better off getting the size and value premiums in public equities or is there something special in, in private equities? Because we've kind of said, okay, illiquidity... Maybe not so interesting. We've kind of talked about manager skill. Maybe not so interesting. Net of costs, unless you can get the best private, uh, or the, the best venture capital funds. Uh, so now we're saying, are there deeper, for example, size and value premiums, the extent that you'd be willing to pay high fees for them in private equity? Uh, so 2021 paper, replicating private equity with value investing, homemade leverage, and hold to maturity accounting, Eric Stafford finds that direct investments in private equity funds can earn lower uh, earn lower mean returns than a replicating strategy that consists of low-priced small-cap public stocks mm. with leverage. So you take your small-cap value stocks to roughly match the characteristics of a private equity portfolio, lever it up a bit to match the leverage in the, in the buyout funds, and you can uh, outperform their their returns on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, so 
if it were the case that private equity offered exposure to cheaper assets uh, than could be accessed through public equities, there could still be an interesting advantage to private markets. But in reality, private markets have been seeing their valuations rise uh, to an extent where, where it's p potentially on par with or maybe even more expensive in some cases than public equities. And that's what Bill Janeway calls the unicorn bubble. He talked about that on our podcast. Um, now, historically, and there's a chart from one of the papers I looked at that we can put in the video here, um, there's this seemingly obvious relationship between the historical valuation gap between public and private equities uh, and the future return gap between public and private equities. So as the valuation gap has decreased historically, the return difference or the PME has, has decreased uh, on future returns, which makes it look like in some cases, or historically maybe, uh, investing in private equity was a way to get deep value exposure that you couldn't get in public markets, but that's largely gone away as valuations have increased. Uh, AQR has in their expected return assumptions that they produce, they, they do a breakdown for uh, private equity, largely based on the methodology in the paper that we were just talking about. And as of Q1 2022, uh, for the current vintage of US buyout funds, they peg it at 5.9% net of fees. Um, now, for equities with a tilt toward factors, they have roughly 5% real. Those are both real returns. So there is, say, 90 basis points net of additional real expected return for private equities. But in their methodology for private equities, it's levered, uh, I think it was like 103%. Um, so there's substantial leverage built in there. Could you lever up your, your public equities a bit? Could you tilt a little bit more to get that similar return without having to go through private equity? I think probably yes. And that's what some of the other research that we just talked about suggested as mm -hmm. well. Uh, okay. So IRRs, which private investments often showcase, are not rates of return. Um, better metrics like the PME and multiples of money uh, when you use those private equity returns have been similar to uh, public equity, especially when they're compared to smaller and cheaper companies, and especially if you add a little bit of leverage. I would I would love the, the the two first papers that we talked about that used the Russell 2000. I would love to redo those papers uh, if I had all of their data with like the S&P small cap 600 or with the dimensional uh, micro cap or the dimensional small cap value fund or something like that. I would love to see those data because just based on the relative performance of the Russell indexes and those other indexes over the period in question, uh, I think the PMEs would all drop below, well below uh, one. But I don't have access to those uh, to those data. That's one th one of the problems with investigating uh, private uh, private equities. The, the other thing that's important is that there's huge dispersion in fund returns between the best and worst private equity funds. So in buyouts, you can avoid the worst funds because they're persistently bad, but you can't pick the best funds ex ante uh, because there's no evidence of persistence. Mm -hmm. In VC, there is evidence of persistence, but you probably can't get the best managers. Therefore, you should look at the median return, which has historically been uh, a PME quite significantly below uh, one. Any illusion of diversification from private equity is simply due to its illiquid nature and the way that it's valued and reported. Uh, if you de-smooth returns or measure with fair value accounting, like the other paper that we mentioned, uh, it becomes pretty clear that private equity is just as risky, if not riskier, than public equity. Uh, so without evidence of a distinct Ill illiquidity premium, uh, without evidence of the ability to benefit from manager skill, even if there is manager skill present, uh, or a diversification benefit in private markets, I find it pretty tough to make a case for this asset class uh, unless you have skill in selecting the best the best managers. That's the other thing is like there is dispersion. So, you know, it's tricky because if, if a, if a consultant or whatever says, I will get you access to the best managers. I mean, I guess it's like, it's the same thing as public equities. If someone can give you access to the best actively managed public equity funds, ex, ex ante, uh, you would take it. <laughs> There's no evidence that you can get that, uh, but you would take it. I think it's the same thing it's the same thing, but even more extreme because of the more extreme dispersion in private markets. If someone can sell you access to the best private equity funds, you should take it if they can actually give it to you. But yep. there's no evidence that they can. Yep. Uh, in venture capital, there is there is some of that uh, evidence. Um, 
anyway, so there's, there, there is something there before fees, but after fees, which are say 6% or so, there's not a whole lot of leftover for investors. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I thought so. And I want to reiterate that, that the paper that I, the first paper that I mentioned, private equity performance, what do we know? I said it's a 2020 paper. It's a 2014 paper. I guess it doesn't really matter. It's a paper in the journal of finance though. Excellent. All right. Anything else this week, Ben? Uh, no, we covered a lot of ground. I think uh, I think that's it. All right. Again, thanks to everybody for listening.